The making of 253 Matilda. A documentary by Ambassador 1 and Ambassador 5 for consumption by humans on Earth. In the year 2053, scientists on Earth receive a transmission from an asteroid in the Oort cloud, and it's in English. The Centaurians are on their way, and they've made use of your old television transmissions to reverse engineer one of your languages. The 253 Matilda project kicks off slowly in the 2070s, as humanity dreams of its own interstellar mission. The Centaurian ambassadors land on Earth in 2096, an event now known as First Contact Day. Here on Earth tomorrow is the 102nd First Contact Day and our people across all our nations are excited for it. Some of the ambassadors are happy to stay on Earth, but six of us want to go home, and our asteroid didn't have enough or left for a return trip. So it's the six of us who help accelerate the 253 Matilda project with our superior knowledge and experience, and when Matilda's journey begins we plan to sleep the vast majority of our way home in hibernetic suspension. I was last awakened 33 years ago. Let's bring in the creator to tell us a little about how this story came to be. Hello there, ambassadors. Wait, isn't that the terrorist Arash Amadi? I'm not here as Amadi. I'm just here as Paul Nerum, the creator, writer, and producer of 253 Matilda. Well, okay, I guess. I will keep three of my eyes on you. The genesis of 253 Matilda was pretty simple. If somebody made a futuristic space science fiction series... Without anything implausible in it? Could it work and still be compelling enough? That does not happen often, does it? Completely possible science fiction set in space, I mean. Sometimes in short self-contained stories, but not in series. Some shows come somewhat close for a while, like The Expanse. But they still slip in impossible time frames and proto-molecules and improbable propulsion systems. And then they totally give up and create a magic portal to another solar system. So I feel there's a severe shortage of stories in the genre that don't distort or break the laws of physics. By not breaking laws of physics, you do not just mean not doing anything that has not been absolutely proved impossible. Correct. I mean not doing anything that appears likely to be against the laws of physics. So no rationalizing a warp drive with ideas of using negative mass or such? That's right. The big problem with realistic physics is interstellar travel is bound to take a very long time. Which is why I wanted to face that challenge head-on by starting the series almost a century into a mission. That's long enough that none of the original astronauts are alive, but short enough that they still feel some connection to Earth, because those Earth-born explorers are still within living memory. Nothing wrong with taking pride in being descended from the man who started us on humanity's first interstellar mission. Detective Amadi, did you know I actually knew Commander Peters? He told me stories about Earth on the first launch day when I was little. I've heard. Interstellar asteroids aren't exactly new to science fiction. But when a story takes place entirely within one, it's normally a dystopia where everyone has forgotten they're in space. So you wanted a more positive and successful take on the asteroid mission idea? That's right. So what were your influences? The biggest influence on 253 Matilda is Charles Chilton's Journey into Space. Journey into Space. That was the last radio drama to draw better ratings than television. What about it inspired you? For the 1950s, Chilton was being hyper-realistic. He managed to pack 20-episode series full of exciting cliffhangers while holding off on the time travelers and the Martians until the middle of the series and making them plausible when they arrived. I also wanted to build a story arc over the course of a season like Journey into Space did so well. Which was unusual in the 50s, but of course is normal on television in the streaming era. Larissa's surface walk accident is kind of inspired by the spacewalking accidents and journey into space that made for cliffhangers in early episodes. Hey, Mitch, where you going? What are you doing up there? It's just like you was a kite and I was flying you. Don't pull on the line, you fool. Let me! Let me! Blow me! Blow me trouble! The line's come on, Parsons! Jet! Hello. Jet! Hello! The line's come loose! Mitch is adrift! He's drifting away! <laughs> The 
And of course, Journey into Space, the world in peril, has crewed asteroid ships, which set off for Proxima Centauri at the end of the series. But where is this Earth they sing about? Four light years from here. Proxima Centauri, where there is a planet which is remarkably like Earth. Yes. You're taking them there? I shall try. But the similarities end there, since Journey into Space was set entirely in the inner solar system. Any other influences? The Dark Forest scenario that I presented in Episode 4 was from Lou Sishin's Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy, also known as the Three-Body Problem trilogy, specifically the middle book, which was titled, appropriately enough, The Dark Forest. That's a book trilogy. I don't know if there have been television or radio adaptations anywhere. We calculated it was a very small asteroid traveling more than half the speed of light. This is an unthinkable scenario in the natural universe, so we believe it was an intentional strike. The Dark Forest? I don't understand. Before first contact, we had a problem we called Fermi's Paradox. The question of why no other civilization in all the galaxy had made contact with us yet. One proposed answer was that our galaxy is like a dark forest filled with hunters where each civilization is trying to avoid detection by any other for fear of immediate destruction. Where did the idea to make Centaurians speak through computers come from? The best way to make a realistic alien is to leave as much as possible for the listener to fill in, which is the greatest advantage of the audio medium. Making them use machine translators was a good way to accomplish that. Any alien voice would sound either too human or too corny, and making them communicate via scent and pheromones accentuates their alien nature, and it implies a kind of insect-like quality. I don't feel like an insect. Was handing over major roles to machine actors a bit of a risk to take? There's a good BBC radio comedy series called Ability, where the central character can't speak due to cerebral palsy and he uses a tablet to talk for him. The computerized voice works well there, so I figured it could work for me too. The voice of Five is rather primitive for the technology of the year 2198, is it not? I prefer to call my voice classic, not primitive. Ambassador One, you seem to have forgotten that you already explained that in Episode 6. If I may ask, Ambassador, your voice sounds so different and in some ways more natural than Ambassador Fives, except you don't seem to use contractions. Why is that? We all have our idiosyncrasies. Five chose a translator voice that emphasizes his alien nature to you. If you sometimes cannot understand him easily, he does not care, or more likely he enjoys your struggle. I think he likes the attention and unusual voice commands, he is rather pungent in our language as well. Interesting. Thanks for the insight. Okay, now let us meet some of the other people involved in the series. Virginia Hargrove played Marissa Flint, the Centaurian computer, and the mother of the evil terrorist leader who is so rightly slain. My name is Virginia Hargrove. I'm from Lansing, Michigan, and I play Marissa. I originally started doing the recreation episodes for Quiet Please, which was a 1940s radio show of which they lost 12 episodes. I helped recreate three of those episodes from the original Willis Cooper production. That led into doing original productions with Paul, and here we are now. It's been a lot of fun so far. I absolutely adore the fact that I can very clearly empathize with my character. There are a lot of similarities, like my character. I'm also 26 years old. I'm an older sister. My brother is seven years younger than I am. But what helps me understand my character so clearly is the relationship she has with her sibling and almost losing that connection. The first few episodes, we follow the journey of Larissa experiencing a traumatic injury. And the fact that Marissa, my character, almost lost her sister is something I can really relate to. I actually almost lost my brother to a brain tumor that he had to have removed at the age of two. 
I would have to say when something like that happens, there's absolutely trauma on both sides. Trauma for myself, having almost lost him, and trauma for my brother, because you don't quite come out of that the same, especially when you undergo something as severe as brain surgery. That's actually something that the character, Larissa, has to battle with. We will hear a little more from Virginia later. Here is John Gauntz, who played Dr. Stone. My name's John Gauntz. I play Dr. Stone. I'm an actor for the last 30 years, and for the past couple of years, I'm a voice actor. If there's somebody who's listening to this who likes the work I've done, you can get me at my website, johngauntz.com. My name, John, J-O-H-N, Gauntz, G-A-U-N-C-E, dot com. So I've known Paul, we met years ago when he ran a philosophy discussion website. We became friends there and have sort of kept in touch on Facebook and social media for the last number of years. Turns out that he was producing audio dramas and I was doing voice acting, so it seemed like a really good fit. And I started doing some voices for some of his projects. So... I think Dr. Stone is fascinating. He's a little bit of a mad scientist, not in a really cartoony, over-the-top crazy way. But ever since Dr. Frankenstein, there's been in literature a exploration of, you know, when technology, how far is too far? And when, when is it okay to play God and when is it not? And I think that's where Dr. Stone lives. He lives in that ambiguous area. It's a really fun place to see, and I would love to see that continue to get explored. It might be interesting to see, you know, does does he ever have regrets? Uh, He's he's pretty, I think he thinks he's the smartest guy in the room most of the time, and he probably is. It'll be interesting to see if he finds himself uh, with a little less confidence ever. This is a really neat project. I really enjoy it. And here is Roger Arnold, who portrayed the mayor for the first six episodes and the former mayor in the seventh. You will notice the character has no name, because he is a man for whom his job really has been his life. Hello, my name is Roger Arnold, and I portray the mayor. I have been involved in acting and theater and directing of one sort or another most of my life, beginning my senior year in high school. I went to a small college called School of the Ozarks. At this institution, they give you a job that you work uh, 20 hours a week, and that helps to pay for your tuition. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to go to college. After I finished there, I went to grad school at Kansas State University, where I got my master's degree in theater. And as I said earlier, I've been involved as an actor or director ever since I moved to L.A., to try to make it as a professional actor. And the first job I got was working with Eliza Minnelli in a new musical that she she was preparing to take to Broadway. And then I did several, you know, extra roles in commercials and, and different things like that while I was in L.A. Realized I really didn't know what I was doing, so I moved back to the Midwest, and I live in Wichita, Kansas now. I found out about 253 Matilda through Facebook. I had seen a a request for an audition for uh, audio drama, which I love to do. And so I made uh, a recording. I was actually auditioning for another couple of roles, but they ended up saying that my voice would sound good for the mayor. So that's how I got the role of the mayor. And I really enjoy the mayor. I hope that uh, he can get back in control again. But he's given up his role as the leader of the community. And uh, hopefully we'll see that he is needed back in that role uh, over the next several episodes. I really enjoy the show. I hope everyone else that hears this is enjoying it as well. I will say that I've just completed narrating an audiobook, The House on Maple Street, which is a haunted house type story. One thing interesting about it, to me at least, is that it seems to have every element of a haunted house story of any haunted house story I've ever read. And I've read quite a few. So if you're interested, it's on Audible. 
Amazon and iTunes. So hopefully you'll be interested to, to hear more and uh, you'll be interested in uh, picking up the audio book and seeing if you find it as interesting as I did. I guess that's about all I have. I hope you continue listening and it'll be interesting to see how the show develops. Thanks for listening. Finally, let us hear from Ahmad Judah. Hi there, my name is Ahmad Judah and I play Dr. Peters, the therapist. I am a pharmacist by day and music producer by night. I'm fairly new to the world of voice acting, but I have worked with many voice actors on podcasts in which I produce music for. My forte is in music production and sound effect production. You can find me on pretty much all the social media platforms at Silver Sage. That's silver without an E. My website is silversage.com. No E in the silver again. Instagram is Silver Sage Official. Most recently, I produced the soundtrack to another podcast audio drama called Tubular Teens with Titans, and I actually released a soundtrack album, which you can find on Spotify, simply called Tubular Teens with Titans Season 1 Official Soundtrack. Thanks so much, everyone, especially to Paul, who listened to this amateur attempt at voice acting. Take care, everyone. What about the people we haven't heard from? How did they get involved? There's a bunch of actors I've been using already for my other audio dramas for years who I knew I wanted to bring in. Lindsay Townsend, Virginia Hargrove, John Gauntz, David Loftus. Those were the known quantities, so I tried to give them the roles that suited them. Matt Ellis and David Feldman are the co-hosts of the Quietly Yours podcast series, and I know Matt is a bit of a revolutionary, so of course he came to mind when I needed someone to portray the leader of an ideological revolt. The rest of the actors audition for the parts through a Facebook group and casting call club. 5. Who is your favorite non centaurian character? Obviously we two are the best, but who is next? The mayor is the next most interesting character. He's sort of a villain at first with an abrasive personality, but he does what he thinks is right, and ultimately he's able to set aside his personal pride for the greater good. Who's your big one? Chief Meg Peters. He is the everyman of the series, a regular guy amid the swirling chaos, a stand-in for the audience. The arc for Peters is how Maradona tries to recruit him into the Returnist camp. Can we count on you, Salish? It's time to make a choice. You're either with me, or you're with the mayor. But Peters finds himself pushed further away by Maradona's methods, until he comes to the ultimate betrayal in Episode 7. Peters really carries the first episode, so I wanted to give that role to David Loftus, an actor I have a lot of confidence in. And I thought it would be apt for him to carry the last episode to bookend it. I wish there were time to see a bit more of the emotional fallout Peters may go through after helping bring about the death of his friend. But at least he has a therapist close at hand. Both of those characters have to evolve over the course of a series. Who else is changed by the story? Larissa Flint. She goes through a traumatic accident, becomes the center of controversy. She ends up with the brain of a sister she never met and has to work through what that means. And she is growing up. It's normal to experience a loss of innocence at your age. A revelation that life isn't what you thought it was, and your dreams were just dreams. Sometimes, it can be very sudden, triggered by something like your trauma. And just as often she's the impetus for the actions and dramas of others in the story. Like Arash Ahmadi, he had a bit of a journey as well, from law enforcement to terrorist and back again. My concept for Ahmadi is that he started apprenticing for Detective Ekholm, thinking it'd be an easy job. In a close-knit town of 200, it's probably years between petty crimes. If only Detective Ekholm were still alive, he'd never have let you go down this This path. Then his mentor dies, and then suddenly there's an actual case for him to investigate. But he doesn't know what to do, and then the mayor keeps pushing him in a certain direction. And then he kind of snaps and just goes rogue, because his infatuation with Larissa feels more valid than anything else. It's a rather quick transition from cop to outlaw rebel, but he was never really comfortable in either role. Amadi is this kind of a messed up kid. Although, with time, he could grow into the job. Ahmadi should have been shot along with Maradona. It's a disgrace that he was made a detective again. I think we'll have to agree to disagree there. Did you have to do any recasting? The initial actor I got to play Ahmadi sounded nothing like the character should. About 
40 years too old and too much of a hard dose professional cop stereotype and a bit of a strong accent too. So I took over that role at the last minute. The guy who originally played Ambassador 5 was very hard to understand, so it was taking too many retakes and too much editing time. So I replaced him with eSpeak after the second episode. Also, between episodes 2 and 3, two of the actors disappeared. Production was delayed for a month until I gave up and did some emergency recasting to replace the mayor and the announcer. Reaching another solar system is a hard problem. At the speed of early 21st century Earth's fastest space probes, it would take around 65,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri, and the mass required to keep even one person alive is a lot more than a NASA probe. But the cosmic speed limit of 300,000 km per second does not actually rule out speedy interstellar travel. If you could accelerate constantly at the rate of Earth's gravity, you could make it to Proxima in just a couple of years. From your perspective, which would be about five years for an Earth observer due to time dilation. Although if you want to decelerate at your destination you'll need three and a half years. Or closer to six for the observer, so why can't we just do that? Basically, it is because rocket engines need fuel. It is the tyranny of the rocket equation. The more fuel you put in your rocket, the more mass you need to lift, which makes you need more fuel again, rinse and repeat. So what's the solution? Using resources in space to make your fuel, so that you do not need to lift the fuel out of Earth's deep gravity well. 253 Matilda is the ultimate expression of that goal, where the fuel is mined from within the body of your spaceship asteroid itself. With a big enough mining operation, this makes it plausible to run the rocket engines constantly for the whole mission. Of course, when you are pushing around an asteroid that weighs 10 to the 17th power kilograms you're not going to get the kind of fast acceleration we are used to seeing from a rocket launch, but that does not matter so much in space where you have no drag so your velocity is constantly compounding with any slight acceleration. With a huge number of incredibly efficient engines eating tons of or every minute, 253 Matilda manages a millimeter a second a second. I plugged that into an online calculator and found that in 92 years it'd get them around 18,000 astronomical units, presuming they started a little slower and built up acceleration. Which even without any or processing or engine improvements would happen naturally as you begin to lose mass. But are you sure an asteroid really makes more sense than a spaceship? We need to think about an interstellar mission in an entirely different way from space probes. It has to be designed to be self-sustaining from the ground up, and that means you have to go big. Around 200 people is a common estimate of a minimum viable human population with enough genetic diversity. Of course frozen sperm and eggs from Earth could help too. And you will need to bring a lot more than just people to make a reasonable life. Hey there, Jesus. Lovely day, isn't it? It's always a lovely day in the Arboretum. It's almost like being on Earth. Why don't they just hibernate the whole way? It's the obvious solution, and that way they need a lot less resources. Unfortunately, all the evidence so far suggests the human body cannot simply halt the aging process and shut down for centuries. They are incapable of hibernation. Their bodies are very inferior. All properly evolved beings are capable of hibernation. Wow, would you look at that view? 3D projections just don't do it justice. It's incredible. So, why a story about this asteroid out of all the uncountable many asteroids out there? 253 Matilda is somewhere humanity has already explored with a flyby in 1997, so we have a connection to it. I note it has just enough gravity to rationalize footsteps without trying to say everybody wears magnetic boots about a tenth of a percent of Earth gravity. Yes, although there's still a bit of artistic license in the effects. Things wouldn't actually sound that way in gravity that low, but you'd never understand what was going on if I tried to make it realistic. Plus, I'm not sure anybody actually knows how to make it realistic. It is quite a massive asteroid, likely more so than you would pick if you did not need it to have gravity, but it is not quite implausibly large. You can easily understand it would have plenty of or to sustain engines non-stop for nearly 800 years, but it is not quite huge enough that it seems as absurd as trying to push a planet through space. 
You can almost imagine a massive array of engines eating massive amounts of ore to push a 50-kilometer asteroid at a millimeter a second a second. It helps make the point that it is not how fast you accelerate that matters on an interstellar trip, it is how long you can keep the engines burning. So what do the engines burn exactly, and how do they get so much energy out of it? I'm afraid that's classified information, sorry. It is worth noting that communications with Earth will get slower and slower through your journey. 253 Matilda is about three and a half light months from Earth, which means waiting seven months for a response to a question. I only hope that I'll be able to hold things together here for the seven months until we can hear your response. It won't be easy. That's a bit like a colony of 17th century might have experienced trying to get rid life from a European power, quick enough to try and slow enough that it incites potential rebellion. That brings us to the issue of the design of the society. For an 8th century mission with limited communications with home, one would want stability to be the overriding concern. All I've ever worked for was stability. To be a stepping stone to faithfully hand off the mission to the next generation. That lends itself to an authoritarian political system, but one that places an emphasis on the rule of law rather than personal power. The precedent which non-constitutional removals would set would enable future mayors to rule by decree, destroying the very thing I want Judge Lee removed to protect. The rule of law. Without the rule of law, the future becomes unpredictable and the mission cannot be assured. The limited number of careers and the need to use everyone efficiently leads to an apprenticeship system where someone has to apply to apprentice in a desired section and may be rejected if there's no room or their qualifications don't suffice. After a few years of apprenticing, a person becomes an assistant and finally they can become a chief and lead a section. The man has the power to dismiss some chiefs, but not all. I was able to fire former Detective Amati, but it's outside my constitutional powers to remove Dr. Stone or Judge Lee. In an unpopular section, you could accidentally become a chief very young. When you vote for me, you're not voting for a spoiled brat who accidentally became our detective at 24 due to an untimely death and quickly got fired. In another section, you might be stuck at the assistant level for life. And while transfers are possible, they require a bureaucratic process and waiting for an opening. Nobody on Earth needs permission to change their career or needs to wait years for an opening in their preferred industry. The people of 253 Matilda are taken from all over Earth with an eye on the genetic diversity you need for a sustainable population of 200 and because it is an international project with contributions from nearly all of the world's national space agencies. American English is adopted as the common language since the Centaurians already know it. The Chinese Yuan is adopted as the currency. I sentence you both to a hundred yuan fine. <laughs> Ninety-two years into the mission, pretty much everybody is ethnically and racially mixed so you see a lot of names where the first name is from one culture and the last name is from another. Accents are generally lost over the generations, but exist in some cases where they are practiced for a purpose, for example the priests speak in British accents because they feel it projects a sense of differentiation and sophistication. I can offer the ceremony of spiritual exploration. So, Paul, what was the budget for the production of this first season? Zero dollars, zero cents. How did you make that work? A lot of the credit goes to the countless people who have shared their sound effects under open licenses, and to freesound.org for making it easy to search and find them. The effects process starts with searching freesound filtered to the CC0 license. That's Creative Commons Zero, essentially public domain. Because there are hundreds of sound effects in each episode, so if I used anything that required attribution, then keeping track of people to attribute to would be practically a full-time job. And the credits would end up being 20 minutes long. <laughs> There's usually an effect pre-made that does what I need. Sometimes I need to apply some distortions or layer a few different effects. Do you ever have to make your own sound effects? Occasionally. Probably about once per episode. 
For example, I couldn't find the sound of finishing dinner and pushing the plate away, so I recorded that clatter of silverware and sliding of a plate along my kitchen counter, and then I used that in episode 7. I'm stuffed. What about music? Kevin McLeod has made a ton of public domain soundtrack music that I've been using in my productions over the years. He's definitely one of the bigger reasons it's possible to make quality soundtracks for almost anything for free. But there are a lot of other musicians who join him on freepd.com, which is the main site I've been using. During the production of 253 Matilda, I also discovered Jason Shaw's Audionautics.com. Audionautics is really great for having a fantastic search interface that lets you search for music by mood and tempo and genre. I'm sure listeners have noticed that I use a lot more music than most audio dramas, to the point where about 90% of the time has a soundtrack and the other 10% is for dramatic effect. For this kind of a story, I think it helps for conveying the emotions of the scenes, but it's more of a cinematic feel music-wise than a radio drama feel. Of course, music rarely perfectly fits a scene, so I usually have to modify it a bit to make the right notes hit at the right times and also to make it the right length for the scene. How did you record the lines? Did everybody have to get together on a call? Each of us recorded our lines separately. Nobody actually heard the actors they were responding to, except for me, I guess. Often I'll request a few retakes after, but that's usually for pronunciation or microphone pops. For the most part, it just works. What sort of equipment is involved in that? Whatever you've got. Personally, I use a $15 microphone and record in my living room. You can spend thousands of dollars on sound equipment in a professional booth, and in an audio drama, nobody will really be able to hear the difference. What was the most time-consuming part of production? Simply assembling the lines in order from so many different sources and giving them the appropriate volumes. Do you wait until you have all the lines to start on that? No, uh, that'd delay production a lot. Definitely by weeks, even. I start when I've got about half the lines. I need that much because I want to have the timings somewhat close, and when I record lines, I tend to do them at a different pace than other people do. So I just want to minimize the timing issues I'll run into later. Anyway, then I record a temporary track of myself playing all the missing characters so that I can get started assembling lines in order. On the second pass, I go back and add the background room tones and most of the effects. Music is usually the last major layer to be added. There's another pass to clean up the timings and the transitions after all the lines are in. Then I go through applying stereo effects to everything, which is actually not as time-consuming as you would think. And I make sure to listen to an episode on speaker as well as headphones at least once, just so I can catch if something is inaudible that needs to be heard. What was the most complex scene to produce? The temple scene in episode 6, by far. I mixed it separately from the rest of the episode. Welcome to the house of God, Mayor. Thank you, Father. I've brought a sacrifice for the fire. May your sacrifice bring peace for us all. If only it could. There were 11 tracks in that scene. Seven of those for effects, one for music, and three for dialogue. I was trying to create something really intense and overwhelming, especially for the hallucination part. Stop! What software do you use? All the production was done in Audacity, an open source audio editor. For the YouTube video editions, I wrote a bash script that takes an audio track and generates an appropriate length video from a still image using FFMPG and then applies the audio to it. I use my decade-old desktop PC running KDE Neon Linux. The first season of 253 Matilda has two main storylines. There is the initial three-episode story arc of Saving Larissa and the Returnist Rebellion arc of the last four episodes. Then across the whole season there is the growing possibility of a speed increase which is more about setting up a season 2. 
Let's delve into the themes, shall we? By the second episode, complex issues arise with cloning and an apparent clash between human and alien morality. Then in the third we have a debate somewhat analogous to Earth's 21st century abortion debate. Without making someone into a religious extremist, I couldn't really come up with much of an argument against pre-viability abortion, so I moved the goalposts and put bodily autonomy on the opposite side of the equation to make it a more interesting conundrum. You can see that there is a division of thought, that that closely relates to the abortion debate and decisions going on right now. You know, is it right to do A, or is it more right to do B? I think at the end of the day, when we're put into that tough position to make that decision, the answer is not so simple. Episode 5 dives into the returnist debate, whether people involuntarily born into a mission can be rightly condemned to continue. Then we have the mass personal dilemma of how to protect the mission without killing his people, and how to accept that he himself is an obstacle to peace, and issues of democracy and the consequences of choice. So I believe that one of the themes is mental health and being aware of how things can psychologically affect another person. These feelings of alienation from yourself, I believe it's what we call depersonalization disorder. It's a feeling of detachment from your own mental processes. Traumatic injury, loss of identity, that feeling of you just want normal. But somehow, though you're really grasping for normalcy, you just don't seem to understand how to attain it anymore. And you can see that my character in relation to Larissa and this traumatic event is struggling with she too just wants things to go back to normal. I've been feeling really disconnected there too. Marissa and I have been arguing more. My father hasn't checked in at all, and I don't think he cared if I survived or not. And I'm kind of pissed about that. Maybe the two disconnections are related. Do you feel like nobody cares about what you're going through? Mental health and Larissa's recovery in particular is a part of the story that I wish I'd been able to explore longer. I got to a point in episode 7 where I realized kind of everything else in the story was finishing up before I'd been able to get to finishing Larissa's story, so I kind of hurried Larissa's ending to her story, sewing it up by having her struggles push her to the realization that they need to push for their own mission. I'm younger than almost all of you, but I've been through a lot lately. I've had to reconsider who I am and what my purpose is. In this referendum, all of you have to do the same. Going through a traumatic experience, she realizes that the only thing worse than traumatic experiences is not having anything happen at all. Not trying is worse than failing. Not having really lived, like her clone, is worse than a traumatic life. Gliding through life without ever attempting to make anything of yourself is worse than failing at everything you try. What I'm asking for is a leap of faith. Faith in ourselves. We don't need Centaurians or mission controllers telling us what our lives are for. We don't need to have the answers for ourselves yet either. We just need to start the ball rolling without being ruled by fear of failure. If there's one thing I discovered from nearly dying than waking up with parts of my clone's brain in my head, it's that there's something worse than failure, and that's to never have tried, to never have experienced. I believe that we can make something of ourselves by taking on a mission as vast as the universe and as open-ended as our imaginations. And as someone with a mostly empty, boring life who's afraid to try things, I make these shows to help fill that void and create experiences. You see that everyone's decision to save Larissa is based on something different. Uh, Marissa, it's out of familial love. Arash Amadi, it's out of a one-sided love and perhaps lust. You see that it is on the doctor's perspective, a scientific achievement. You see the desire to not save her out of a question of ethics. 
on the parts of other people in the series. Um, and those can also be politically driven. What is justice? This series presents different versions of justice. Judge Lee offers what she feels is the justice of understanding, which the mayor sees as a gross miscarriage of justice. Many listeners probably agree with Judge Lee because we think saving Larissa's life was worth the laws broken. But then we see how this leniency can backfire. And this hostage situation is your fault. And so is Patel's death because you let Amadi and Stone go free. I trust you understand now how letting criminals off the hook encourages them to commit further crimes. For the mayor, justice is maintaining societal order and stability, protecting the people from chaos. For Judge Lee, justice must be flexible to the circumstances and shouldn't punish someone for doing the right thing even if it's against the law. And then in the finale we see the best version of justice, Ambassador One's justice, which is retribution against the man who kidnapped me. What happened here? Justice. What's great about audio dramas is that they do target a lot of important issues in an artistic fashion. I think it would be very interesting to play a villain. I've always been someone who rooted for the hero in shows since I was a kid, but there's something freeing about letting yourself act as a villain, especially one with an iconic voice or accent or someone with interesting vocal tics. Who are the heroes and villains of this story? Presumably the Centaurians are the heroes, and the terrorists are the villains. I didn't want the realism to be just scientific realism populated with traditional Hollywood heroes and villains. I wanted to make a story that's morally ambiguous, without being cynical or flippant about it. A story where it's really up to you to choose who the good or bad characters are, because everyone has good aspects and bad aspects and reasonable arguments. Real life is full of complexities and shades of grey. And too often fiction tries to simplify it into a conveniently black and white message to shove down the audience's throats. I'm sure my opinions on the issue show through, but I'd like to think it can be listened to by someone who completely disagrees, and it gives everyone new things to think about. While the mayors normally serve for life, their power is not unchecked. They serve the mission, they serve mission control and earth, and they serve the framework of law designed to make a stable society. In the last episode, we introduce a dose of democracy to this environment and see how it affects things. This is not an absolute change, it is not a revolution where there are going to be elections every year now, but it is an attempt to use democracy to defuse a crisis and resolve differences. One of the issues it brings up is what sort of voting system is there for resolving differences. The author appears to prefer ranked choice. I think we should use ranked choice voting. What's that, Peters? It's a system some countries on Earth use for instant runoffs. Voters number their preferred candidates in order. During counting, candidates are eliminated from the race from lowest vote count on up, with their votes reallocated to the next choice of their voters. With plurality voting, it's far too easy to end up with a result most people don't want. But, Salish, I don't get why you had them add the third mission option to the ballot. If you're committed to our return to Earth, I was trying to split the non-returnist vote. Oh, that makes sense. It would have worked nicely if they'd stuck with the plurality vote, but they went with ranked choice, so I don't think it helps us. Pro-revolutionary science fiction is everywhere, because it makes a compelling story and we want to believe society's problems can be fixed all at once. 253 Matilda sets up the usual revolution scenario and then subverts the expectation by having the revolution fail miserably because the people reject it. That's part of the realism of the story. Revolutions aren't fun and games and in the real world they made things worse more often than they made things better. Take 21st century Earth's Arab Spring for example. You could argue a couple countries benefited, but the rest suffered. And most people would rather accept a dictatorship than risk chaos and civil war. Basically, I'm making the case for patience and subtle reform in a setting where the need for stability is amplified. We face the possibility of a societal breakdown, and nothing is more frightening than that when you're in interstellar space relying on all systems running smoothly to keep you alive. Maradona is, of course, basically a communist revolutionary, 
someone with apparently good intentions who wants to make the lives of the people better by taking down the system of power that controls them. At every stage, even when he's trying to overturn their votes and firing lasers at them, he believes he's acting for the people. He has an admirable courage of his convictions, but ultimately the character is a bit of a fool who fails to understand the motivations of the people he's acting for. At every step, he believes everyone is behind him when he actually has only a tiny number of followers with him. Six is enough to get this job done, and we'll count on the rest of our supporters to help us from the outside once we're holed up in the Arboretum. In the end, it is his trust that his friend Peters has been won over to the cause that gets him killed, but in a wider sense it is his idealism which prevents him from understanding how much the people value peace and stability. Let's start wrapping things up. What do we know about Season 2? If Season 2 happens, that'll come out sometime in 2023, because I need a bit of a break from it before writing anymore. I do have a rough idea of it in mind already, though. I heard we will be jumping forward 18 years. That's right. Fortunately, that's a lot easier to do in audio, where you don't have to have the actors wear aging makeup all the time. And a lot of us were playing characters way younger than we actually are anyway. Personally, my character is 24 and I'm 42. Lindsay Townsend's character is 18 and she's 42. So what will 253 Matilda look like after 18 years? Everything that's gone on so far makes me very interested to see what's going to happen with all these different relationships that are going on in the story and how they drive that forward. I think we're going to want to watch out for a few different characters to see how it develops. And I'm very excited for season two. I'm pretty sure Marissa will be promoted to the communications chief. Larissa will be the chief mechanic. Peters will be more of an engine specialist nearing retirement age. Will we be accelerating close to light speed? Not quite that fast, but Peters will have managed to accelerate the asteroid dramatically. And the big news is they'll be approaching their first new star system. Episode 7 hinted that one person may be left behind in a deceleration capsule to explore a planet. We could probably devise a probe capable of slowing for landing. Maybe even a one-person spacecraft. Slowing a tiny pod quickly is a much easier problem to work on than decelerating our entire world. Of course, it'd be a one-way trip, no way to catch up again. Who's going to volunteer for that? Yes, they'd be able to send daily mission reports, and the crew will probably take a strong interest in those, but no real-time communications. This is my view of what interstellar exploration could actually realistically be like. Could there be new aliens? Maybe, maybe not. There is some possibility of a new species intercepting 253 Matilda to investigate the increased speed and determine whether it's a relativistic weapon threat. I suppose it's even possible a small human craft could catch up with them from Earth on a one-way mission using the new war to reach relativistic speeds. I would imagine we will also start to notice a time drift between 253 Matilda and Earth, with relativistic effects causing it to be maybe a year later on Earth. Let's cut to the chase and ask what everybody is wondering. Will a passer to five be back in season two? Well, to be honest with you, it's unlikely. Ambassador 1 is condemned to be awake, so we can expect to hear from him. But Ambassador 5 will be hibernating. You never know what might wake him up, though. So just to confirm here, Episode 8 is going to be 18 years after Episode 7? Well, there's also a possibility of doing an intermediary episode or two set somewhere in the years between Seasons 1 and 2. If I could find a guest writer who'd like to write an episode, and please do contact me if that's you, then that'd be an ideal time period for them to explore with a self-encapsulated story. Well, that is all the time we have for you humans today. We hope you enjoyed this look behind the scenes of 253 Matilda. See you next year if the writer has the sense to include me. The making of 253 Matilda included the voices of Paul Nerum, Virginia Hargrove, John Gauntz, Ahmad Judah, and Roger Arnold as themselves. 
Ambassador 5 was portrayed by eSpeak. Ambassador 1 was Microsoft Azure's neural voice Eric. This program is licensed for free use and distribution.